Next, we're going to talk about recurrent neural networks. And we'll go back to this document, cl document uh, classification example. Um, in, the, in the chapter we described using a LSTM recurrent neural network, um, and that's what we're going to implement here. So the first thing I do is look at the average length of, of the documents. This is the word count in the document. So it's about 178. And 91% of them had less than or equal to 500 words. This gives us a sense of the size of the documents because you call for re recall for recurrent neural networks, we want sequences of the same length. So in this case, the sequences are the sequences of words in the document. The feature for each document is going to be the sequences of words. and We want them to be the same length. And so based on this little exploration, we'll limit the words to be 500 words per review. And if the review's longer than that, we'll just truncate. And if it's shorter than that, we'll pad it with blanks. So just so I remember the, this, the idea of recurrent neural networks versus bag of words. Bag of words just used the presence or absence of a word, but now we're going to use the order in which they appear. And it, That's right, it? Rob. Yeah. So now we think of a document as a sequence of words. And of course, this is a sequence of these one hot encoded word. So the, the feature vector for each word is a very sparse 10,000 dimensional vector with just one one right. and zeros elsewhere. Right? So that's the input for a, um, a recurrent neural network. Although we can use an embedding, one of these learned embeddings to reduce the dimension. Okay, so here we go reading in the data, doing the padding of the sequences, and I just show the, the, last, the last 10 words in, in one of the, the sequences, and these are just indices of words in the document. So at this point, it just stores each document as dictionary indices for the words. So the first layer of the re recurrent neural network is going to be an embedding layer of size 32. And then we're going to learn that during training. So rather than encode the word as a one-hot encoding with 10,000 elements and only one of them one, we're going to learn an embedding layer, which has just got 32 elements. And so you'll go from the digit label to a 32 vector. And that embedding layer is going to be learned. So that's the specification here, layer embedding. You can think of it as, as multiplying this binary vector by the, the, the matrix, but it's done more efficiently than that. And then the hidden units, which are themselves a sequence in the recurrent neural network, are going to have um, themselves 32 units. And then the output is just the sentiment of the document. It's just a, a single variable. And so that's how we specify that. We'll give it three epochs. You'll see that the recurrent neural network is, is pretty slow. We'll use a batch size of 128, and, uh, and then we'll make predictions. Um, we may even stop this if it takes too long. Uh, you can see it chugging through. The, remember, there was 25,000 training observations and 25,000 tests. So these are training documents. So it's, taken, it's going to take a long time. So we're going to stop that. Um, it doesn't do very well anyway. Um, it did actually worse than the, than the GlimNet and the, just a regular uh, neural network on in, the... In the bag of words uh, neural network? In the bag of new, words it model. It did worse. Yeah, so it did worse. So we stop it. Okay, well, we're nearing the end. The last topic is, is time series prediction. Um, so I see the section numbers didn't appear yet, but uh, we can fix that. This is the New York Stock Exchange, where, recall, we had the sequence for the Dow Jones return, the log volume and log volatility for 
uh, um, a number of years. The data is in the ISLR2 package, so we'll, we'll read it in, and we scale the data the, to, to have unit variance and mean zero. And there's a designated training and test set on, on the data set. So is train is a binary variable, which is true for each year that is in the training set and false for each year is in the test set. And if you recall, the first number of years were training data and the subsequent years were test data, which is often what we do with these kind of time series data because of the, the series autocorrelation in the data rather than randomly mix up the training and test data in the time series. Well, where you want to predict the future from the past. Is yes, right? exactly. So we want to create lags, so we write a little function for computing lags, and you can dig into that and, and see what it does. And if you recall in the, in the, in the chapter, um, we created a model matrix for autoregression where the X, the, 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 in other words, an X matrix, where the features were the response lagged one day, two days, up to five days back, and also the other two features. So the response is, is um, log volume, but log volatility and Dow Joe returns were also features, and we also use them at those lags. And so that's what we do here. We use our lag function that we created to create a data frame that has all of those in them. If we look at the first five rows, we'll see we have some missing data because at the beginning of the series, we can't make lags going backwards. So we're going to remove those um, and there'll be five of them that we need to remove. Okay, and so that's what we do there. Now we'll just fit a, um, a linear regression model. Um, I think at this point, let's just show, let's just show some of the rows of AR frame. I'll just look at the, the first three rows. So there's the response, it's going to be log volume. And now you see lag one, Dow Jones return. Lag one, log volume, lag one, log volatility, mm -hmm. lag two, and so on. So it's created those lags for us, up to lag five. Okay. And okay, so now we fit a linear model and we make predictions. And then we compute an R squared. And these are the lines for computing the R squared. We, non we want the null variance and then the prediction error, the mean squared error, and turn it into an R squared. And we get 41%. Mm. Is that good, Ron? I, anything to do with the stock market that's 41% sounds pretty impressive. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Now, it would be nice if we could predict the stock price right. at, with 41% accuracy. Right. But it turns out log volumes, volume traded yeah. on a given day is, is I think, yeah. easier to, to predict. We saw in the text that if you added day of the week, so each of the days in this, these data is a, a trading day, and they occur on days of the week. And some days of the week have higher volume, often at the beginning or end of the week. So we're going to add that as a, a, it's a factor variable. We're going to just add it to the model and refit. And we see that the, the R squared goes up to 46%, which is clearly that's an important variable, right? So we now use an RNN to fit these data. And the RNN expects something a little different, right? It expects a little sequence, expects a data set of sequences. Right. So the sequence in this case is for each day, the sequence is the sequence of lagged days. And at each lag day, we've got a three vector, which are the three measures that we have. Right. So it's a, they're short sequences, they're going to be sequences of length five, but those are the sequences that go into the RNN. Okay. And that's described in, in detail in, in, in the book. Right. So we can see there's 6,046 training days. The sequences are of length five, and each of them is a three vector. Okay. And now we fit the RNN, the, the 
these structures start looking the same after a while. Here we include dropout. This was after a little bit of trial and error. The, the hidden layer, which is again is a sequence, they're going to have 12 units. Um, and these are the details for the RNN. And we fit the, the, the model similar to what we did before. So this is going to amount to sort of a nonlinear time AR model, is that right? It's a it's a yeah. it's a funny thing, Rob. Yeah, mm -hmm. not quite a nonlinear AR model because it's it's got the same. It uses remember for the RNN mm -hmm. in the in the structure that we described. It's got the same weights for each of the hidden units, right? Right, and the hidden units is a sequence of five hidden units. Mm -hmm. So the same weights take the input into the hidden unit and the the previous hidden unit to the next hidden unit. So it's a different structure. In a little bit, we'll, we'll, we'll actually flatten the neural network and we will do a nonlinear AR model. Mm -hmm. But the RNN is a bit different. And like all RNNs, it takes a while. RNNs tend to be slow in our experience to, to some of the other neural network models. But it seems to flatten off, and we, we've got a validation data set. Um, I believe, in this case, just the test data set, and, and that's in green. And when we, let's see, somewhere down here, it's telling us how well we did. And it got 41% as well, R squared. At so, 45 before. Was this day of week in here? Or? Day of week's not in here. Uh -huh. Day of week's okay. not in here. So, so it doesn't do any better than, the, than just a simple autoregressive model in this case. Okay. It takes about a less than a minute to train. And the, here's the one that you were referring to, Rob. This is where we actually don't fit it using a, uh, an RNN. But we, we, we just flatten it and fit it as a, a neural network. And by flattening, what that means is that it just creates basically the same features that we used in the autoregressive model. And if we fit that model, let's see, that would, that would do it. Um, what we do here is we actually have the model that was used for the, for the linear model, autoregressive model, and we can just use that and fit a a neural network on that. And that's what we do over here. And what you'll see is that it, it, it gets the same performance as the, as the autoregressive model. And it's, it's given us some plots. And in the R console, we see, oh, and this used day of the week as well. And it gets the same results as the autoregressive model. So I guess we're seeing here that you know with all, all the hype about deep learning, it is a great thing, but we, there's also a lot of cases where it doesn't do better than these simple models, right? And we've seen now two or three That's right. cases, right? That's right, Rob. And, yeah. and in cases like that, so you're the autoregressive model. It's a well-known and simple, you know, popular model performed as well. Yeah. And if you have a case like that, you'd rather use it. Because right? you can understand easier. it better and explain it better. Yeah. Explain it better. Also for the sentiment, um, the, the Glimnet Lasso model did as yeah. well as the neural network. Right. But on these other models, like the image classification, it's really hard to beat a neural network. Yeah. They, they, you know, that's the way to go. Okay, well, that's the end of this lab. And, uh, that, and so this lab has shown you how to use um, Keras and TensorFlow to fit uh, neural network models. And there's other ways of doing that, right, Don? Yeah, I mean, it seems that more and more people are using PyTorch. PyTorch, right. you know, which is also a Python uh, package for fitting um, deep learning models. So we will have available on our website some PyTorch yeah. versions of these exercises. Right. right. In fact, um, there's a Torch package um, developed by R Studio. This Keras was developed by R Studio, and there's a Torch package developed as well, and in a short while, we'll have an implementation of this lab in Torch. It's actually been translated by a team at our studio and, and mm. by the 
maybe by the time you see this, this lecture, that will be available as well. So thank you. Great.